Good afternoon, and welcome to today's event, Confronting China's Transnational Authoritarianism, How the Transatlantic Community Can Respond. I'm Dave Shulman, Senior Director of the Atlantic Council's Global China Hub, which leverages the Council's expertise on China and global network across our 16 centers and programs to devise allied solutions to the global challenges posed by China's rise. And I would like to thank the Atlantic Council's Europe Center for co-hosting and helping to organize this great event with us. One of the truths that drives the Atlantic Council's China program is the increasingly obvious fact that what happens in China now no longer stays in China. There was a time when U.S. policymakers and leaders across the democratic world lamented the Chinese government's track record of repression of its own people, but ultimately judged that human rights and related issues at home in China had limited impact on China's foreign policy abroad and its global impact, and thus should not play an outsized role in determining how the U.S. and our allies engage with China, diplomatically, economically, and otherwise. That time has passed. The PRC has become much bolder in taking actions that demonstrate, without question, that the party state's authoritarianism and repression at home translate to aggressive efforts to pursue its interests abroad including within the territory of foreign countries, no matter the local laws of the societies in which they are operating. China's transnational repression is a growing problem across North America and Europe, from attempts to silence free speech by bullying foreign companies and nonprofits, to persecuting and coercing ethnically Chinese citizens of other countries, to spreading disinformation in foreign media environments, to establishing undeclared stations to monitor and threaten dissidents abroad. The evidence is overwhelming that China's actions are a threat to open societies and to the transatlantic community, and the question we now face is how to collectively counter those efforts. Today, we are fortunate to have a truly fantastic panel of experts who have addressed these issues from a variety of angles and are going to help shed some light on how the transatlantic community can respond. Let me introduce each of them now. Nathan Law is a Hong Kong activist, currently in exile and based in London. During his participation in the Umbrella Movement in 2014, for which he would later be jailed, Nathan was one of five representatives who took part in dialogue with the government. Nathan then became the youngest Hong Kong legislative counselor in hot history in 2016, until his seat was overturned by Beijing in July 2017. Nathan left Hong Kong due to the risk of persecution under the new national security law, and now devotes himself to espousing the importance of democratic values and freedom around the world. Michael Chong was first elected to the Canadian Parliament in 2004 and currently serves as Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs for the Official Opposition in Canada and as a Vice Chair of the Canada-China Relations Committee in the House of Commons. Michael has served in the Federal Cabinet as President of the Queen's Privy Council, Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, and Minister for Sport. Michael has also served as Chair of several House of Commons Standing Committees and is a co-founder and member of the All-Party Climate Caucus. Joanna Gao serves as Regional Director for Asia-Pacific for the International Republican Institute and is a non-resident senior fellow with the Council's Global China Hub. She brings more than 20 years of experience in international political development, nonprofit management, and citizen empowerment to her role at IRI and has lived and worked in the Asia region most of her life. And finally, I would like to introduce our panel's moderator, Annie Boyajian. Annie Boyajian is a Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at Freedom House and serves as the Mark Palmer Distinguished Fellow. In these roles, she oversees Freedom House's policy and advocacy work, and she was a contributor to Freedom House's recent reports on transnational repression, authored a policy brief on the democratic crisis in Hong Kong, and is a former board member of the Hong Kong Democracy Council. In other words, a perfect background to moderate this excellent panel. So Annie, let me turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks so much, David. No pressure after that great introduction. Thank you so much to the Atlantic Council for hosting us for this very important topic. It's such an honor to be joined by Nathan and Johanna here in person and by Mr. Chong online. We could talk about this topic for hours. I promise I will keep us to one hour. Um, so you'll see me checking the clock to make sure I keep us to time and also occasionally checking my notes because COVID has made it impossible for me to remember facts and figures like I used to. So it's great to be finally in person with everyone. What we're going to do today is hear opening remarks from our panelists. Then we're going to have a little bit of conversation here in the room. 
And then we have folks joining us here live, but also online, and we want to have time for audience Q&A. So folks in the room, if you have questions, if you can go ahead and enter them in the iPad, we'll be able to select questions all on the screen here for our panelists to answer. Um, I feel like one important commonality of everyone on the panel today that I should highlight uh, is everyone has either as an individual or the organi organizations that they work for have been sanctioned by the Chinese government, which I think is a testament to the great work that you all are doing. So um, kudos uh, and keep it up, and it's an honor to be with you. Um, today's topic is, is quite broad, um, and so I thought I would start by framing it um, with a global look through the Freedom House lens. We have tracked, unfortunately, 16 consecutive years of decline in freedom around the world, and that has been driven in part by worsening repression within mainland China, and then the Chinese Communist Party's increasing efforts to extend that authoritarianism and repression abroad. So within the mainland, you of course have atrocities and acts of genocide being committed against the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. You have persecution of Christians, Falun Gong practitioners, imprisonment of um, Tibetans, human rights lawyers, folks who have dissented online um, and we, with over the last eight years, have actually seen a decline in the score for China um, in a pretty significant way. It's declined by about half. We started at 17 and we're now at eight. Um, and so that's, that's a notable step. Typically for countries when we see decline at Freedom House, we're declining by half a point, by a point um, in any given year. Uh, and that has been coupled with the activities of the CCP abroad. So you have transnational repression. At Freedom House, we have done two reports on transnational repression, which is the targeting of dissidents abroad. Um, we look at physical cases of transnational repression, and we have documented since 2014 735 cases globally. 239 of those were committed by the Chinese government, um, and they do run the most comprehensive and extensive campaign of transnational repression around the globe. We saw uh, recently the prominent case of the protester being beaten up by officials outside the consulate in Manchester. Um, but we also see efforts by the Chinese government to shape the terms of free speech, redefine what is free speech, redefine what sovereignty means, um, even redefine democracy recently. Uh, there are global efforts by Beijing uh, to influence media around the world through propaganda, through redefining what free media looks like, what the purpose of media is. Uh, and so it's really quite an extensive campaign when you look at the full picture of transnational authoritarianism. So uh, I'm really looking forward to discussing today and unpacking what are some of the responses that we have seen that are working. There is pushback, um, and I think that this is a really important thing to highlight. We have folks inside mainland China who have been dissenting and able to successfully push back and also around the world. So I want to unpack that more and really look at what can governments, what can corporations, what can average citizens do. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to our panelists for their remarks, and I'll start with you, Nathan. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Electing Council, for organizing um, this event. Um, I think this is definitely a very crucial um, um, topic. As um, Annie just said, that uh, we've been in a democratic recession for almost two decades. And we've seen the rise of uh, the PRC and its um, authoritarian expansion. Uh, we've seen the protests in Hong Kong, the human rights atrocities in Hong Kong, um, the reports of the concentration camp of millions of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. We've seen how China has been tactically supporting all those human rights atrocities in Myanmar, in Thailand, and also claiming an unlimited collaboration with Russia. So what we've seen is uh, the rise of dictatorial camps and the rise of authoritarianism while our democratic force is in re resection. For me, as a Hong Kong activist, um, it's definitely worthy to look into the issue from the lens of Hong Kong, what Hong Kong has been through, and also looking at the change of attitude of the Chinese Communist Party towards the role of PRC on the global stage in order to unpack why we've seen a rise of authoritarianism and this authoritarian expansion nature of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I was a student leader in 2014. I was fortunately to be elected as a parliamentarian um, in 2016 at the age of 23. 
to become the youngest uh, legislator in Hong Kong's history. And then I was jailed and went into exile in 2020. The life trajectory of mine actually resonates uh, the change of Hong Kong's politics and the erosion of freedom. In 2014, we still had the room for public protest. We still had certain political diversity. In 2016, we still could participate in political debate with the government. There was a room for the political opposition to operate. But eventually, uh, we've come to um, the end of the political freedom and civil society and the political diversity of Hong Kong in the year 2020, after the big, massive 2019 protest and the introduction of the national security law. That kind of um, demise of civil society actually took place much earlier in mainland China. And the Chinese government just transplants that political control from mainland China into Hong Kong. So we, it was actually nothing new for uh, Chinese watchers and people who are concerned with the Chinese human rights violation. But what it means uh, is that uh, China has been shifting its focus from a more reserved, uh, a more benign um, stakeholder and player on the global stage to a much more belligerent, aggressive one and want to topple the current world order in order to craft an uh, environment that benefits its dictatorial standing. Uh, when we look back um, in, the ten, uh, in the year 2000 and to 2010, uh, China was uh, much more reserved. Uh, they are much more um, 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 focusing on an internal uh, element and that was also the time which what we call the honeymoon period of Hong Kong's one country system where um, there weren't much uh, intervention from mainland China to Hong Kong's system. Um, and the reason was at that point, uh, the PRC was still trying to convince the world that um, China is stepping towards the liberalized path. They still want to learn from the West. Um, and also they try to uh, make a case that if we can preserve the freedom and um, the weight of life of Hong Kong, then we can learn from it and the world can be at ease that uh, the PLC would be stepping into um, a path that is closer to the system, which is the system of Hong Kong, a much more liberalized one, internationalized one, rather than to step on its own path. Um, but what it turns out is really clear that China took another path, that it used ultra-nationalistic narrative that it focuses on the uh, so-called um, rejuvenation of the, um, na national, uh, the national rejuvenation and also the end of century of hu uh, humiliation, the way that they um, give themselves a, m a moral basis, um, ideological basis, to be a much stronger player on the global stage. And also, um, they've been actively reshaping the narrative about democracy, about human rights, um, creating an um, environment for them to sustain the totalitarian uh, ruling and become um, basically uh, uh, um, trying to um, reshape the global order in order to make an envir environment to them to sustain the totalitarian governance. So what we can see is um, as they no longer need Hong Kong to be an example of um, a liberalized path, to an example for them to have the basic respect to the one country, two system and the kind of like promises that they had um, to move towards uh, an, a more open society then um, for them, there was no reservation to destroy Hong Kong civil society as they no longer lead Hong Kong as an example or as a case that they can learn from. So that was literally what happened um, in the year, year 2019, 2020, when all our civil society collapsed. Um, the persecution was severe. Most of uh, the activists that I know in Hong Kong are in jail or on the process of going to jail um, and um, the political diversity completely um, gone. So that is, um, I think, a major lesson learned by the world, um, how quick a free society could collapse under an unchecked government, how ambitious and aggressive the Chinese government um, is going to be and has been uh, without much of our understanding and at law management, and how basically naive that we perceive that the PRC will liberalize themselves if we do more trade with them, if we just stay and stand aside and, and, and leave nothing, um, no mechanism to hold them, hold them accountable. Um, so for now, I think it's a crucial time for the, um, for the uh, countries like the US and working with the UK and European Union and other democratic allies to focus on how we can blunt the influence of the Chinese Communist Party, how we can craft a better, better collaboration um, in a transatlantic um, collaboration 
how we can amass enough resources, um, influence, and also if uh, democracies are working together, we've got more than half of the world economy working together to confront China's um, authoritarian expansion and all those measures, economic measures that they use to blackmail the countries that um, criticize them and um, infiltrate into um, their country's uh, political and media and cultural um, system. So this is a time I think we have to stay united and we have to come, come up concrete measures to work together. Otherwise, um, the democratic recession will continue, the rise of authoritarianism will continue, and China will properly dominate the understanding of democracy, freedom, um, and open society in a much uh, more opposite way um, than we used to think. So um, I think um, more unity, more collaboration, this is what we're heading to. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to unpacking that further. And uh, Nathan did not know I was going to do this to him, but I'm looking forward to hearing some of the good recommendations you have in your book, Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back, which I commend to all of you. But we will turn next to Mr. Chong. Mr. Chong, thanks so much for joining us. Well, great to be here, uh, Annie. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Nathan and Joanna. Um, Two people have done a lot of good work on the issue of uh, China's authoritarianism and its threats to peoples both here and abroad. Um, I think that it's clear that Beijing has been wanting to export this model of authoritarianism around the world. As Nathan mentioned, it's clear uh, that they view uh, an extraterritorial application of their laws as completely in order even though that violates international law and the domestic laws of many other countries. So speaking from a Canadian perspective, uh, we see a lot of that exporting of their authoritarian model um, in various ways here in Canada. Um, we see a lot of interference uh, coming from Beijing. Um, a couple of areas that come to mind is first, um, interference in uh, our research and development regime, interference in our intellectual property regime. Um, our security agencies have identified five sensitive areas um, where Beijing is uh, a threat in terms of stealing intellectual property and a threat to national security. Um, those five areas are the areas of art artificial intelligence, quantum technology, uh, telecommunications in the form of 5G, uh, biopharmaceutical research and clean technology and the development of clean technologies uh, and critical minerals and the like as we transition to a, 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 an emissions-free future. So um, that's just one area where China is trying to uh, interfere in democracies. Another area uh, that we've seen interference here in Canada is in its intimidation, its direct intimidation of Canadians, particularly Canadians in the Chinese community. In the last several years, we've seen uh, Beijing and its consulates coordinate uh, counter protests uh, to pro Hong Kong democracy activists, to those standing up for the rights of Hong Kongers, of Uyghurs, and of Tibetans. Um, we've had cases on university campuses where uh, Canadians uh, uh, from the Uyghur community or for the Tibetan community uh, were standing up to talk about issues concerning human rights um, and they were being threatened uh, and harassed uh, by, uh, by operations coordinated through the consulate um, in Toronto. Um, we've seen more recently uh, Beijing interfering in our free and fair democratic elections. Um, in the 2019 campaign, it's recently come to light that Beijing funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars illegally to more than uh, 11 election candidates. Um, in the last election in Canada a year ago, we've seen Beijing spread disinformation uh, through proxies on Chinese language social media platforms like WeChat and Weibo. And, and so these are just some of the threats that we are seeing here in Canada on Canadian soil coming from Beijing as part of its effort to export its authoritarian model, export uh, the imposition of its laws, its extraterritorial application of its laws um, here in Canada. 
so we are of the view that the that we need a robust plan to counter it. Democracies have traditionally been open and transparent societies, um, making us vulnerable to these kinds of attacks. But I think we're now realizing that we need to counter these these threats. Um, we need to beef up law enforcement resources and tools uh, to ensure that uh, we protect our intellectual property, that we protect Canadians who are standing up for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We need a we were calling for a central coordination office in the government of Canada to coordinate cases of foreign interference and intimidation here in Canada. Uh, we think our anti-money laundering laws need to be beefed up. There's evidence that Beijing is funneling a lot of money uh, through Canada in the form of real estate, uh, in the form of other transactions that are helping some of the kleptocrats, some of the oligarchs uh, clean their money. Um, and we need clear rules on research and development partnerships. Um, we believe that uh, the federal government should be banning partnerships with PRC controlled entities um, and directing uh, federal agencies no longer to partner or to fund these kinds of partnerships, as well as advising universities against the same. Um, and so I think democracies, while often slow to react to these kinds of threats by the very nature of our open and transparent and free societies are slowly coming around uh, to dealing with these threats. And I'm confident that by working together, we will be able to uh, counter these threats um, together uh, in the future. So thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thanks so much, Johanna. We'll go next to you. All right, thank you, Annie and Atlantic Council for for inviting us for this, this, this really important panel. Um, and, and what I wanted to do with my opening was really to touch on some of the things that you started to, to address, Annie, and really sort of focus on the framework through which this transnational sort of uh, authoritarianism can take place, which I think is very closely connected to the lens through which the Chinese Communist Party views the world. Um, so, you know, from, from IRI's perspective, we, we view China, you know, we've worked in and on China for most of the last 30 years. And we look at China in a series of, of concentric circles, right? So there's inside China, there's what we call the immediate near, so Xinjiang, Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Um, and then there's China in the world. Now we work in all of these spaces um, and we, you know, we have programming in all three. And I mention this because I think it's really important to remember that as we get into this discussion on the topic of China's transnational authoritarianism, it's important to remember there's a billion people inside China who are subject to China's domestic authoritarianism, right? They are living under a system of governance for which they had no choice, right? They had no choice in that matter and they have no control over it. Um, and so obviously in terms of our mission at IRI, you know, that, that sort of goes against everything you believe in in terms of sort of freedom and, and human dignity. But I, I think it is also important to understand that the way the CCP treats people inside China is very consistent with the way it looks at the world. Um, and, you know, and so inside China, you have a party, the party that is motivated to maintain power at any cost. Um, and it's really, and that really means sort of squashing any potential threats to that power. Um, and, and so, you know, for, for people inside China, that message from the party is quite explicit and quite clear, right? Everything comes from the party, everything is owed to the party, meaning religion is a threat, independent organizations are a threat. Um, the party exerts power by acting sometimes quite brutally against those that, that are critical of it and speak out against it. Um, you know, you started mentioning there is this long and growing list of groups who have ended up on the wrong side of the line of what's permissible behavior and permissible action and speech in China. So, you know, women, migrant labor, you know, migrant workers, um, human rights defenders, you know, the lawyers that defend them. Um, and when you move out from, from inside China into the immediate near, there's almost a million Uyghurs who are, who are paying the price for, for this desire to exert control. Um, I grew up in Hong Kong, you know, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Nathan, we will talk about this more, but you know, in the space of a very few years, we've watched our vibrant home city um, transformed by brutality and by fear of more of that to come. 
And so, you know, the party also exerts power and control by managing the way that people think about the party um, and by controlling information, by controlling people's movements um, and by controlling their interactions. And, you know, we hear more and more about the use of technology that is really facilitating all of that inside China and now increasingly outside of China as well. And so, you know, we see this through line from the way that what is happening inside China to the way Beijing sort of interacts in the world and operates in the world. You know, we see Beijing trying to shape a global environment that's going to ensure its own survival and its ability to thrive. Um, and it's, you know, it's going to use every carrot and stick at its disposal to do that. Um, and so, you know, I think at this point, we're all pretty familiar with the tools that, that China is using. Um, there's the economic influence piece, right? And in IRI's most recent report, we, you know, our recent research shows that economic ties are still really the main entry point for other kinds of influence around the world. Um, and, you know, and so we have these arrangements under the Belt and Road Initiative where you know, these opaque deals that are made, where China is able to lend money to a country so that it can purchase services of Chinese companies and hire Chinese workers for infrastructure for any deals, right? We know, we know this story. Um, to make these deals, to get these deals to happen, We've seen the CCP cultivating friends and co-opting elites through, you know, sort of personal enrichment. And that kind of corruption then sort of exacerbates vulnerabilities, existing vulnerabilities in, in the political systems. And so, you know, across the world, you've got the CCP taking advantage of weak governance in places to, to exert its influence. But, but really beyond the economic tools, and I think something we can get into later, is is this desire to control the information space. And in the you know, 20 odd years that I've worked for IRI in the field, you know, sort of working on China and, and, and monitoring sort of PRC activity, I think this is where I've seen the most dramatic change. Right? It's China's ability to touch local communities and in particular to shape the information space um, to assert what, you know, what China wants to say about itself, um, but also what it is that other people are, are able to say about China. So we'll start with that. I'm looking forward to this chat. That's great. Thanks so much. Well, we have about 10 minutes for discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll turn to the audience. So I hope everyone's getting your questions ready. Um, Nathan, I'll start first with you, because um, some of what we're talking about can be very abstract to folks who are not being targeted. Can you talk about what life is like for you? Um, what are you experiencing in terms of this transnational repression and authoritarianism? What are folks in the Hong Kong diaspora community and um, even more broadly, folks who have left the mainland experiencing? Well, the transnational authoritarian expansion is a very grand and abstract term, but uh, for many people, it's very personal. Um, I myself have heard a lot of stories about even though people who have moved away from Hong Kong, they're still worried that they will, when they, be, when they participate in political events or criticizing the Chinese government, that they would be reported back to Hong Kong and their families would be endangered. And um, for many um, out, people outside of Hong Kong, for example, studying in colleges, I myself uh, was once um, 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 a fellow at the University of Chicago, and I host a series of seminars about Hong Kong and China, and I had to arrange, um, uh, I had to make arrangement with the school, for example, um, uh, strictly um, complying the, um, the Chatham House rule, um, allowing students to use fake name, allowing students not to reveal their faces, and all sorts of protocols to protect themselves. Because some of them, they, they are living in Hong Kong, and some of them living in mainland China, that if they're spotted, that they speak anything that um, are, well, considered as breaching the quote unquote national security in mainland China, which the threshold is really low. If we are saying that our oh, Chinese Communist Party is not, is not fit for governance, then you'll probably be violating all those really strict law um, in Hong Kong and in China. Then um, these students that they may face a lot of persecution, not only for themselves. There are a lot of cases that when the Chinese Communist Party spotted um, a Chinese nationals that they're complaining about the party, their parents call them and to convince them not to speak up. So that kind of line of suppression um, all the way through your family and your dearest friends in mainland China. So what we've seen is um, the, not only like Hong Kong people, but also Chinese nationals, they also are submitted to this kind of surveillance and suppression. 
Um, but when we see um, as um, what we have said about um, economic control, economic backmailing, we've seen um, Canada, Australia, Lithuania, all of them have suffered from um, China's um, economic sanctions or, or, and, uh, or different ways of um, trying to put pressure to these governments to be silent about China's human rights records and, their uh, and, and criticism over um, their human rights abuses. Um, this kind of um, um, suppression, even though for now I think is uh, getting less and less um, effective, um, but of course we need uh, more countries to work together and to um, try to supplement each other, support each other economically and on economic, e economic policy in order to counter these threats from uh, mainland China. Um, but most importantly, uh, apart from this um, uh, international repression, I think what we are facing is um, the global expansion of, of China, not only in terms of its uh, influence, flexing its muscle, but in a way that they are trying to make an ideological war on, on, on what we believe um, about democracy and freedom. Um, in China, there's a, a set of socialist core values that they implemented a few years ago, and it, they are all, all in like strict corners in mainland China. Some of them are rule of law, freedom, democracy. This time, you never consider associate with the model of the Chinese Communist Party, but the way that they do it is they redefine those words. They uh, redefine freedom um, as um, you can operate within the limits of what the party allows you to do. So um, as long as you don't criticize the government, then you're fine. Um, they redefine rule of law as rule by law. They, 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 they get rid of the element of um, division of power, of holding the government accountable in the idea of rule of law. Um, they just say that obeying law, whatever how unjust they are, it is rule of law for them. Like all those terms, they, they embody completely different meanings and, and they are trying to kind of rewrite it and to impose to the rest of the world in order to craft um, a global order that is beneficent to the existence, existence of dictatorship. Um, so I think this is also sometimes what we've omitted uh, when we talk about the erosion of democracy. It is not only like the, the, um, um, dictatorial regimes getting stronger and stronger, but also um, the moral authority and um, the idea of democracy as a superior system, uh, no matter what, is also weakening. So this is also uh, the things that we have to work together. Um, democracies have to deliver. Um, international communities on human rights and democracy have to do, do more to, to, to promote these ideas and to um, retain its, its, um, its credibility all over the world. And, um, enhance the collaboration uh, with civil society, especially diasporic groups who have been persecuted and who have to live a life of exile because they are the vivid example of the terror and all those um, um, persecution of um, all these dictatorial regime that many of them actually um, are a big example of um, saying why we have to defend our democratic system, our free society, even though there are a lot of problems that we have to fix, even though we know that there are a lot of flaws. So I think these are our role ahead. Nathan, you mentioned surveillance and China's role in the tech space and, and surveillance and internet infrastructure is something I wanted to touch on, particularly in light of Mr. Chong, your mention of R&D and AI technologies. So China, in our Freedom on the Net report, is the worst abuser of internet freedom for the eighth year. And there is a lot of interesting research out there about China exporting surveillance technologies to now around 80 countries. Um, what they have done in Xinjiang and elsewhere on the mainland is quite terrifying when you read about that. But a, a question I commonly get, probably similar to a question you get, Mr. Chong, is, OK, but aren't you being alarmist? Because just because China is exporting these technologies doesn't mean that the Chinese government intends to use them to surveil folks here. Just because they're helping build internet infrastructure globally isn't that what all countries and international corporations want to do. Um, and so Mr. Chong, my question for you, with the government lens that you have, um, sort of where some element of R&D cooperation, um, sales, and things like that. 
are needed, but from your perspective, why is what the CCP is doing uh, a concern for governments? Um, and you talked about uh, what can be done in Canada. I'm curious if you have thoughts on just what democracies more generally can do. Yeah, I think it's clear from evidence that we've gotten from our security and intelligence agencies that China has an active plan uh, to steal intellectual property in the five sensitive areas that I've mentioned, um, but also has a plan to, uh, to disrupt our national security in those, using the technologies of those five sensitive areas. And so I don't think it's alarmist at all uh, to say that uh, Beijing is threatening um, our intellectual property regime, um, our national security in these five sensitive areas. And so I, what I think we as democracies need to do is we need to work more closely together uh, because there is so much cross-border collaboration uh, between our universities, between our research institutes, between uh, civil society, um, that we have to work together and we have to say, look, uh, in these five sensitive areas, we are going to agree that partnerships with Chinese state controlled entities like Huawei, for example, uh, with other uh, technology companies, companies in the area of uh, artificial intelligence, biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, that we're not going to allow for these partnerships because it's just too risky. Uh, based on the evidence that we have about um, China's malevolent activities. Um, and at the same time, we're also going to you know, be much more proactive with our universities um, to tell them and to advise them against such partnerships. So that allows us to respect academic freedom well, at the same time, making it clear that there is a real threat. Look, in Canada, just this past week, um, our national police force, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, arrested an employee of Hydro-Quebec um, and has arrested this individual and, and is proceeding with a case that concerns this individual uh, stealing intellectual property as it relates to the development of new electric technologies, technologies that can be used for the transition uh, to... Uh, a renewable future. Um, and so this is serious stuff. Uh, we invest a lot of money, a lot of effort as democracies into research and development, but that regime, that intellectual property regime has to be respected. Um, and so I think uh, that's just one area where we need to work more closely to deal with this very real threat. And, and as far as you know, some suggesting that we're overstating the threat, well, I don't think that would be what you would hear from uh, two Canadians, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver, who were wrongfully detained for two years by Beijing um, for no reason other than their retaliation against the uh, the uh, case against uh, Meng Wanzhou, uh, the daughter of the founder of Huawei. Um, I don't think uh, people in Xinjiang would view this as uh, being overly alarmist either. You know, one of the things that's always struck me about Xinjiang and the uh, persecution of some 12 million Uyghurs in that province is this. Xinjiang is one of the poorest parts of China. Um, it's a region that traditionally has been left behind. It's not part of the prosperous coastal provinces that have seen huge economic gains in recent years. It's always been a bit of a backwater. There are some 1,400 technology companies in Xinjiang. Uh, a lot of these uh, tech companies in China, like Huawei, are treating uh, the population of the region as uh, a bunch of guinea pigs, using them to develop the latest surveillance technology that in real time uh, can make decisions about arresting people. Um, and so this authoritarian model, as you mentioned, uh, China is not just prepared to develop for its own uses, within the People's Republic of China, but is fully prepared to violate international law and export this authoritarian model that blends technology with an authoritarian form of governance to places like Hong Kong in violation of the, the Sino-British uh, declaration that guaranteed Hong Kong's autonomy, that guaranteed Hong Kongers liberties and freedoms for 50 years from 1997. They are also exporting this to places like Iran uh, they've signed agreements with Iran to export this technology, this system. Um, and they're working with many other countries in the Indo-Pacific region and beyond to do exactly that. So I think we should all be rightfully concerned 
about uh, the export of this authoritarian model, about China's transnational application of its laws. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, what Freedom House has indicated is that there, that democracies have been on their back heel for the last 20 years, um, and that this authoritarian model is ever increasingly on the rise. And so we are really um, talking about a clash between two great ideals, um, our ideals uh, about a belief in freedom, democracy, and the rule of law, a belief in free and open societies where human beings can flourish and live to their full potential, and an authoritarian model uh, that subjugates people, represses them all in the name of the Communist Party in Beijing. Well, Johanna, I want to go to you for a really quick lightning round, because I know it's time to move to questions from the audience. Um, but in the same vein of you know, why does it matter, one of the aspects of the CCP's transnational authoritarianism that we have talked about is their effort to shape the information and media environment. And a question that I get a lot from folks is, OK, but don't, doesn't every government, aren't they all concerned about their public image? Doesn't everybody have state-run media? Can you briefly talk about um, what it is that the CCP is doing and why that matters? And then we'll go to the audience. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of sort of the shaping of, of the information space, one of the things we're seeing is efforts by the CCP and sort of CCP-related entities to purchase local media, to sort of purchase stake in local media in, in countries, or to just buy media, the local media outlets outright, um, because, you know, local media is always strapped for cash. Um, you know, the offering of uh, CGTN or Xinhua wire services. And, and I, I think the difference is that this comes with sort of an expectation of this sort of driving and shaping of the, the sort of China's perspective on the world. And the, you know, the real difference is that when you know, Voice of America is, is being carried uh, by, by a local radio station, there isn't an expectation that no, no other perspective is, is allowed. Whereas you know, when there is Chinese ownership or, or, or con control of these local stations, it really, the, the self-censorship that the other speakers have been talking about starts to seep in, this fear of having any kind of messaging that deviates from what it is that, that sort of the, the, the owners, the, the CCP owners, um, are wanting to, to sort of see or hear come out of that. And it's that, it's that sort of control of, the increasing control of the information space by curating what perspectives are able to be heard through local media channels that I think becomes very concerning. Well, one of the questions that has come up from the audience is an issue that we actually haven't gotten to talk about in detail yet, but some folks are aware of the extremely terrifying reporting of 30 police service stations uh, around the world. Um, and I'm curious if, if folks can talk more about that and, and the audience members wondering, you know, what can be done to address that. And those, the report was talking about um, unofficial locations like an office building, someone's home, where folks um, were, could go to get consular services, but also these were locations that were used to surveil folks, um, dissidents and, and critics of the Chinese government. Um, and there are actually three locations uh, in Canada. And Mr. Chong, I know you've talked about that, so I don't know if you want to briefly touch on that. Um, and then you two can chime in a little yeah. if you'd like to. Well, well thank you, Eddie. Yeah, I, first off, the the regime in Beijing has been brazenly open about these stations. In fact, uh, a list of these stations was published um, in a Beijing-affiliated state-controlled newspaper. So they've not been uh, clandestine about it. They've been fairly open about it. Let's be clear. They are a violation of international law. They're a violation of international agreements. They're a violation of domestic law. Um, and so they should be shut down immediately. Um, if, if, uh, authorities in mainland China, whether in Fujian or other provinces, wish to offer services for citizens of the People's Republic of China to, for example, renew their driver's licenses, they can do so through their accredited missions here in Canada and elsewhere, whether it be the embassy in Ottawa or the consul consulates that they have in places like Toronto, Calgary, or Vancouver. Um, they should not be doing it through these illegally established stations. Um, that's contrary to domestic and international law. Uh, furthermore, the government of Canada uh, should immediately shut them down. Um, the RCMP, our national police force, is currently conducting a criminal investigation. 
But the government, in my view, needs to take more action than just allowing a criminal investigation to unfold. Um, the government should be reviewing uh, very closely uh, information about these police stations and finding out the operators who are working out of these stations, if any of them are accredited to uh, the PRC's embassy or consulates here in Canada, those diplomats should have their credentials removed and declared persona non grata and expelled from Canada for these illegal activities. Furthermore, um, if there are uh, people working out of these stations who came here on visitors' visas from the PRC, they clearly came under false pretenses. They should have their visas revoked and they should be deported. It's only these kinds of strong measures to protect our sovereignty, to protect our citizens, that Beijing will understand. They understand, by the very nature of that regime, uh, a strong, clear position. Um, but when countries don't take strong, clear positions, they take advantage of that. They see the weakness, and uh, whether it's in mainland China or abroad, they take advantage of that weakness to impose their authoritarian worldview. Uh, and if I could add to that, I think I agree with everything that Mr. Chong said. And I would actually say this is an, an, a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate a democratic response to this. You know, as he said, where there's a legal activity, let's talk about the fact where, where we have a rule of law, we follow the rule of law. And when illegal activity takes place, we'll shut these activities down. Um, we have an independent media that you know, got wind of this, investigated this, published the results. Everyone was able to see it. I think there's so much about this that, that we in democracies can use to illustrate the strength of our democracies and the resilience of our institutions. Um, that as a, just as a messaging point um, of, of why rule of law as opposed to rule by laws, as Nathan mentioned, is so critical. Um, you know, following everything that, that Mr. Chong said, let's embrace that and, and talk about how our systems are working. Well, we could talk about this for like five more hours, <laughs> but time is coming close. Um, I see a bunch of questions in here about responses. And so I think for all of you, let's talk about what an effective response would look like, because um, I, I never want to close on a negative note. And we do see positive elements of, of pushback. So how can countries on both sides of the Atlantic, how can governments, how can corporations, how can um, sports teams, Mr. Chong, your role uh, as sports minister, and how can us as general public engage in effective pushback? And some of the specific questions were, for example, Germany and the UK blocking Chinese investment in major chip factories. Is that the sort of thing that should be replicated, um, uh, the effective multilateral sanctions that happened earlier in the year on officials involved in uh, human rights abuses in Xinjiang? Well, um, I, I think first of all, we have to come to an understanding that this is um, one of our era's biggest threats, the rise of authoritarianism, that we have the enough willingness and determination from all countries to come together and to create global agenda, global um, institutions, and amass resources to counter them. Because I, I, I don't think this is a, a, an issue that could be addressed by one country, two countries, even how powerful they are. Um, we are facing a, an alliance of dictators. We're facing the unlimited collaboration of China and Russia. And when dictators came, is so um, in solidarity, then we have to uh, catch up our feet and try to uh, make our camp to be more united. Um, so the, I think this is the first step and the infrastructure of how we talk about um, global response and, and pushback um, to these uh, waves of um, authoritarian expansion. And on, on policy level, definitely, uh, we, we need to uh, really blunt China's influence in our in infiltration in individual countries, um, the, the, the technological transfer uh, activities, um, a lot of um, the blackmailing and, and, and threatening messages towards individuals and towards um, countries all around the world. But of course, um, I think it is really important for us to decrease reliance on China, um, on their supply chain, and all sorts of um, um, economic activity. Uh, because what we've seen in the Ukraine war is uh, Russia have been um, using the energy reliance on uh, Europe to, um, to, to do a lot of attacks and, and to act um, basically on impunity in, in many different levels. So this is something that we have to prepare because uh, what, we've, what we are witnessing is a possible invasion into Taiwan, as the Chinese leader has been repeatedly 
uh, stating, and we must um, have a lot of deterrence policy in place. And one of them is to start um, to build up our resilience um, when there's a need for us to economically dissecting us from them and building up stimulation plans on um, preparing for um, um, a lot of different response over that scenario. Um, I think this is um, the hottest issue and the most important issue now because we, if we allow um, a, a, a democratic government to be invaded um, by this um, totalitarian regime with just purely nonsense in history, um, as we've seen in Ukraine, then definitely the, 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 the ability for us to push back and to say that we, we safeguard democracy is severely hindered and there are lots of economic and geopolitical interest of Taiwan. So um, I think this is one of our prior mission and this is the golden time that we can um, get all the countries together to devise a plan to, to think about how each country can respond um, from the EU, from the US, from the other Asian democracies that are nearby um, in order to prevent that from happening. I, I would jump in and I'd sort of reiterate what I was saying before that I, I think the, the solidarity within the transatlantic community and other democracies um, to really look at, you know, as Dave mentioned in, in the beginning, democracies can sometimes be slow to respond, but at this point with the knowledge that we have, with the awareness that we have and with the urgency that, that Nathan just outlined, to bring all of our democratic toolbox to bear to demonstrate how these values um, can push back on the, the sort of the malign, the, the authoritarian, authoritarian influence, um, and show how how we can do better um, and and use the tools that we have for that. Mr. Tom. Well, uh, I think there's a great deal of cause for optimism, quite simply, because democracies on around the world on both sides of the Atlantic are based on time-tested fundamental principles, principles that have been, that have evolved over the last uh, several hundreds of years and that have created <clears throat> the democratic institutions, uh, the freedoms and liberties, and the rule of law that we all enjoy and that have allowed for human flourishing for billions of people uh, where those principles have been put in place. And so, you know, this period that we're going through over the last several years reminds me of challenging periods that we faced before. If you think about the 1930s and the rise of the Axis powers, um, it looked like democracies were back on their heel and that they were not able to respond to the rise of this new form of alliance, this new form of um, authoritarianism, totalitarianism. In fact, you know, in the darkest of those days, it looked like uh, democracies would, would be conquered by the Axis powers. But we all know how that turned out and democracies eventually got their act to get together. They adhered while adhering to the fundamental principles that, we're all, that we all believe in and that our institutions are based on. And we know what happened, we triumphed. And so I think we're going through a similar period right now where since the rise of President Xi 10 years ago, uh, we have been caught out on our back heel. Um, by the very nature of our societies, he was able to exploit a lot of uh, what makes our societies so so good and but i think uh we're now coming together as democracies on both sides of the atlantic to counter this threat and you know we can see parallels in what's happening in ukraine with russia you know before the invasion of uh, ukraine by russia there was a sense that the nato alliance had outlived its usefulness there were people in the last decade who questioned you know, whether or not the alliance needed a better focus, a new focus, a renewed mandate, um, because it, some had suggested, implied that it really had outlived its usefulness. Well, uh, it just in the last uh, short, mere months since the invasion began on February 24th, uh, the alliance has never been closer in recent decades, and democracies are coming together uh, to work more closely. And I think the same thing is going on with the threats presented by Beijing. And so, I see this, this closer cooperation across the Atlantic in, in sensitive areas of research and development like artificial intelligence, uh, quantum technology, telecommunications, biopharmaceuticals, as well as the development of, of more uh, tighter relationships on clean technology, on critical minerals and development of renewable technology. So, uh, you know, I think there's a great deal of optimism. I'm confident in the long run we will prevail uh, because the fundamental principles uh, that our our system, our de democratic systems are based on, our democracies are based on, 
are based on time, tense, uh, time tested and universal uh, principles that have endured the test of time. So um, I think uh, there's a great deal of optimism. There's also a great deal of work ahead of us to work more closely together on a range of files that concern uh, the threats from Beijing, but I'm confident that we will ultimately prevail. Your remarks remind me of one of my favorite quotes from Dr. King, the arc of the moral universe is long and bends towards justice. Um, and I really believe that. And I thank you all for your wonderful interventions. I will just take moderator's prerogative to say, I think especially with China, the role of corporations is so, so, so important. And so when um, the government gets upset that someone in the NBA is expressing support for protesters in Hong Kong, or that the wrong anthem is accidentally played, or that the map doesn't look how they want it to look, it's incumbent on these companies to push back, and on us as consumers to make it really clear to these companies what we expect um, and to vote with our pocketbooks. But I will turn it over now for closing remarks. Huge thanks again to Atlantic Council for all of you for joining for my panelists. Thank you, Annie. And uh, I'd, I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to everyone for joining us here today and at the Atlantic Council, and especially to each of our speakers for their insights and this interesting discussion. My name is Johan Fleck. I'm the acting director of the Europe Center here at the Atlantic Council. As our speakers have thoughtfully discussed, the implications of a more assertive China on the world stage are a matter that affects each and every one of us, from activists in Hong Kong to polit politicians and, and policy experts in Canada, the United States, and Europe. And as we learned in the discussion, far beyond that uh, uh, around the world. Our economies, our societies, and our democracies depend on a coherent and unified response to that authoritarian uh, transnational authoritarianism, which China is modeling and increasingly exporting around the world. In Europe alone, we're seeing a change in attitudes toward China with Indo-Pacific strategies being drafted across capitals in Europe and at the European Union level. Here in Washington, China and its attempts to supplant the Western international order and our democratic systems are issues that are firmly have the full attention of, of U.S. policymakers, but also us at the Atlantic Council, not just at the Global China Hub, our partners in this event uh, at the Europe Center, but across the Council's 16 programs and centers, which I think is important. That was, I think, a takeaway from this broad discussion that we need to look across all of these policy areas. Um, but as we keep the geopolitical level uh, and picture firmly in our minds and perspective, I think um, it's important to remind ourselves of the very human cost of these Chinese policies for individuals and, and, and the bravery of, of those confronting them. Uh, um, as Nathan, as Johanna, and, and Shadow Minister Chong outlined and, and uh, exemplify in their personal experience, I think, as, as activists and as citizens. I encourage everyone to keep following along with the Council's work on China, Europe, and the transatlantic response to China's policies, which so often overlap. Um, and please do follow, keep following our panelists. Thank you again to our viewers, and, and thank you to our panelists again.